Anyone who has ever driven on American highways has probably noticed an interesting sight. Every so often, you see sets of three giant crosses standing erect, usually on a hill alongside the road. They are there to remind people of the death of Jesus. But the question is, why three crosses? In Christian teaching, only the death of Jesus really matters to us. In today's program called Death Sentence, we're going to look at the men on the other two crosses next to Jesus, the two men who died with him that day. And that's because in the story of these two men, we can find a message that says something vital to each of us today. It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing hope around the globe. It was late in the day during a hot and humid Louisiana summer in 1996. 14 year old Crystal Champagne left a family apartment in West Wigo to walk to a nearby grocery store. She'd made the walk many times before. She said goodbye, walked out the door and was never seen alive again. A search began and by the next evening, her body was found along a levee in a nearby city. She had been strangled to death. A murderer was on the loose. The victim's half-cousin, 21-year-old Damon Thibodeau, who had been at the apartment house when Crystal left, was questioned by police right away. He was given a lie detector test and was told that he failed. Police then began a gruelling nine-hour interrogation during which he was not allowed to eat or drink. After many hours of intense questioning, Thibodeau admitted that he'd sexually assaulted and then murdered his cousin. Only after being allowed to eat and drink did he recant his confession. But by then it was too late. At his trial, two women testified that they'd seen him near the scene of the crime. On October 3, 1997, a jury convicted Thibodeau of first-degree murder and rape. He was sentenced to death. Damon was held in Louisiana State Prison at Angola, the largest maximum security prison in the United States. Angola is an 18,000 acre complex that still resembles the slave plantation it had originally been. This notorious prison was immortalized in the movie Dead Man Walking with Sean Penn and Susan Sarandon. Though supposedly better now, it was once considered one of America's most brutal prisons. Thibodeau spent 15 years on Angola's death row, confined 23 hours a day to a small cell as he waited to die by lethal injection. There was only one problem. Damon Thibodeau was innocent. Slowly but surely, the case that the state had built against him started to fall apart. For instance, years later, investigators showed that the women who claimed to have seen him near the crime scene did so a day after the body had been found and after Thibodeau was already in custody. Meanwhile, DNA testing on items recovered from the scene of the crime failed to detect any trace of biological material connecting Thibodeau to the murder. The tests also showed that despite Thibodeau's confession, Crystal had not been sexually assaulted. And DNA testing on the cord used to strangle Crystal identified a male DNA profile that was definitely not Thibodeau's. His confession too had been unlawfully coerced as a result of police pressure, exhaustion, hunger, thirst, and fear of the death penalty. The bottom line? On September 29, 2012, after 15 long, brutal years in prison, Damon Thibodeau walked out of his death row cell a free man. Damon Thibodeau was one of 18 people who had been proven innocent 
and exonerated by DNA evidence after serving time on death row in the United States. These were the ones who got out before they'd been killed for crimes they had not committed. This makes me wonder, how many people executed in American prisons were in fact innocent? A low estimate now is about 50 people in the last 40 years. The case of Damon Thibodeau and his subsequent exoneration makes me think of another case involving the death penalty and executions. It had some of the same elements, a capital crime, a sham trial, and the sentence of death. Only this time, things worked out very differently. In this case, a guilty man was set free because right next to him, an innocent one died in his place. What am I talking about? Well, let's go back almost two millennia to the old world, to ancient Jerusalem. No question, Jerusalem today is quite different from Jerusalem 2000 years ago. But one thing remains the same. Intense political and religious conflicts wrapped up in deep hatreds and mistrust. It was the time of the Passover, a feast that Jewish people have been keeping for about 3000 years. It's the feast that commemorates the Exodus, when the Hebrew nation, long captive in Egypt, was freed from slavery and bondage. They had escaped through a miraculous deliverance at the Red Sea. And Jews around the world throughout the ages remember this event every year. However, even though it was supposed to be a festive time, there was deep political tension. Relations with the Roman conquerors were not good. There had been various military insurgencies, bands of warriors wanting to overthrow the Romans and free the Jewish nation from them. Something like that had happened 200 years earlier when Jewish fighters had freed the nation from the Greeks. The threat of rebellion was again real. And I think that there's one thing that we know by now, and that is, Leaders don't like rebellions or uprisings. Witness the violence and chaos in the land just north of Israel today. Syria, as the government tries to suppress a revolt. Whether 2000 years ago or tomorrow, the threat of rebellion, of insurrection, is something that leaders take very seriously. No wonder then, that the leaders were worried about an itinerant preacher from Galilee known as Jesus of Nazareth. This Jesus had attracted a following. And though Jesus never advocated military struggle against Rome, some of his followers weren't so passive. And thus there was a worry that maybe this Jesus, who had performed many miracles, was going to start a rebellion. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, a symbol of kingship in Israel, that didn't help matters. In fact, as we read in John chapter 12 and verse 13, the crowds shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel, probably made the fears of the leaders even worse. For this reason and many others, Jesus, innocent of any wrongdoing, was arrested and convicted. This trial was such a farce that it makes Damon Thibodeau's trial and conviction look fair. Worse still, Jesus had been condemned to death, the worst and most hideous death, the kind reserved for the vilest of criminals, and that was death on a cross. Now, as I said before, in the United States, there are about 1,800 sets of these three crosses, and they're erected in more than half of the states. They've been put up there through the vision of a man named Bernard Coffendaffer. He raised about $3 million and began the project of placing them around the country. He wanted them to be a reminder of the death of Jesus. But the question I want to look at is this. Why three crosses? Almost everyone knows about the death of Jesus on the cross. But what about those two other crosses 
one on each side of him. They weren't empty. Two other men hung there that day with Jesus. Who were these men? And what does their fate say to us right now? For starters, as the Bible described Jesus carrying his cross, it also said that two other men, criminals, robbers, were to be crucified with him. Thus, these two others were thieves facing the death penalty as well. We now come right to these three men hanging on crosses, the ancient Roman version of capital punishment. Let's look how the Bible depicts it in Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 39 to 43. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. We don't know a lot about these two men other than the fact that they were robbers. Now, to be executed for stealing, you had to have been a pretty unsavory character. So what happened? Well, one of these men hanging there next to Jesus starts mocking him. Listen to the text again. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Now, he didn't just make this up. Earlier texts tell us that as Jesus was hanging there dying, some people watching mocked him with similar words. Listen to what it says in verses 35 to 37. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And so this one thief was simply repeating the sneers and the mocking that he heard shouted by these others. And so this one criminal, this thief, mocks him. Well, what happens next? Please notice what it says again here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 40. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Look at the completely different attitude here. First, notice the confession. The man didn't try to cover up what he'd done or even deny it. He didn't blame poverty. He didn't claim a bad childhood. He didn't try to justify himself in any way. No, he admitted guilt. He said basically to the other thief, what are you doing? We belong here on these crosses. We deserve the punishment that we're getting. And so there's no question of their guilt. This thief admits it and admits that they deserve what they're facing. Nothing like what came out of the mouth of the first thief. But also look how the second thief, in contrast to the first one, responds to Jesus. While the first one simply picks up on the crowd's attitude toward Jesus and mocks him, the other takes a completely different approach. He went directly against the current around him. Notice again Luke chapter 23 and verse 41. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Did this criminal really understand the importance of what he just said? But this man has done nothing wrong? Yes, this man, Jesus, didn't do anything wrong. He wasn't a criminal, a thief like they were. 
However, I tend to think that the thief meant more than that. And that's because of what followed next. After he said that Jesus did nothing wrong, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It's obvious that this thief suddenly got a revelation of who was hanging there next to him. The Bible doesn't tell us much about this man, but I would guess that he'd heard or seen something of Jesus beforehand. Maybe the thief saw Jesus riding on the donkey to the cheers of the crowd who hailed him king. Maybe he'd heard something about the kindness of Jesus, even to the lowliest of people. Maybe he'd heard about some of his miracles. Maybe he'd heard Jesus, when they first put him on the cross, cry out, as we read in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Maybe he saw the sign written on the cross above Jesus' head, the King of the Jews, and he surely heard the mockers all but say the same thing. However it happened, the man's words to Jesus show that in Jesus on the cross, the man did see the Messiah. The man did see his only hope of salvation. And so this thief, this criminal, this sinner cries out in utter helplessness and desperation, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say back to him? But yes, I tell you right now, you will be with me in paradise. It's important not to miss what just transpired here, because I believe this story can say something crucial to each of us. This convicted criminal, this confessed criminal, asked Jesus to save him, to give him eternal life in a new world. And what does Jesus do? Did Jesus say to the thief, well, look, I'd, I'd like to help you, but you better clean up your act first. No, that's not what Jesus did. Did Jesus start quoting to the thief scripture about his need to stop sinning? No, that's not what Jesus did. Did Jesus say to the thief, well, I'd like to help you, but people like you are not welcome in my kingdom. No, that's not what Jesus did. What Jesus did was look at this man, this helpless man who had nothing to offer and say to him, yes, I'm telling you right now, today, you will be with me in paradise. This is probably the greatest example of how entry into heaven is something we can't earn. How could we earn it when the thief didn't have any good works to give? He was dying and would probably be dead before sunset. This story shows that if anyone comes to Jesus in their need, in their desperation, in their helplessness, Jesus will accept them just as they are. If we call to him, God will accept us. All we have to do is come to him in our great need and helplessness, as did this thief. And just what Jesus offered the thief, he offers to each of us. We can come to him right now, despite the sin we've committed, despite even crimes we've been involved in, if that be the case. And he will say to you right now, you will be with me in paradise. What an incredible promise. What an incredible hope for anyone to have. There were three crosses on Calvary that day. On one was the sinless Son of God. On either side of him were two criminals, two thieves, two men justly condemned to death, two guilty criminals dying for crimes they did indeed commit. And both had Jesus of Nazareth next to them. And so not a whole lot of difference existed between these two men. Their external circumstances, though bleak, were identical. There was, though, one crucial difference. One man accepted Jesus as his saviour, the other didn't. And look what Jesus offered the man who accepted him, the promise of paradise. The other, the thief who rejected Christ, got nothing. You know, as humans, 
We tend to divide people into all sorts of classes, don't we? We divide people by things like race, religion, gender, age, position, status, wealth, education, nationality, physical appearance and so forth. But in the Bible, I believe there are really only two types of people. Sure, the Bible acknowledges some of the differences that I just mentioned. But at the core, the Word of God has divided humanity into two groups. And I believe that those two thieves represented both groups. I believe all humanity was seen there. Those who have the promise of eternal life in Jesus and those who don't. A pretty stark division, wouldn't you say? And all it took was for the one thief to accept Jesus, to right then and there give himself to Jesus and by faith to believe in him. In that instant, by that act of faith, a life of sin was completely wiped clean. And you know, however good that news is, I believe it gets better. Jesus offers all who come to him not just forgiveness from their past sins, but a whole new existence in Him where they no longer have to commit those same sins. Why do you think the word gospel means the good news? I started this program talking about Damon Thibodeau, who, though innocent, was sentenced to death. But many people on America's death row, unlike Thibodeau and like the two thieves, were guilty. Yet for a lawyer named Daniel and Risa, that's not the issue. For her, the issue is that there are mitigating circumstances in some of these cases. And so she works to get death sentences of some of these guilty men reduced to life in prison. I don't apologize for saying, I love my clients in all their complexity, she said. We insist on seeing their humanity despite what they've done. The name of the organization she works for is called the Gulf Region Advocacy Center, GRACE for short. Yes, GRACE. And in a similar way, Jesus sees our humanity and He loves us even despite what we've done, which is why, because of His grace, if we come to Jesus, as did that thief, we can have the same promise of eternal life. Let's claim this promise right now as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are all like one of those two thieves in that we are guilty of something. And yet, like that one thief who was helpless, who had nothing to offer, you gave him the most wonderful gift a human can have, the promise of eternal life. May we all reach out and claim that same gift for ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been inspired by this week's program, be sure to join us again next week when It Is Written will present another new and thought-provoking perspective on the peace, insight, understanding and hope that only the Bible can give us. God is using It Is Written to bring hope to people around the world. Until next week, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. <laughs>